10 Islam, the West, and the future in the past, Islam and our Western society have acted and reacted upon one another several times in succession, in different situations and in alternating roles. The first encounter between them occurred when the Western society was in its infancy and when Islam was the distinctive religion of the Arabs in their heroic age. The Arabs had just conquered and reunited the domains of the ancient civilizations of the Middle East and they were attempting to enlarge this empire into a world state. In that first encounter, the Muslims overran nearly half the original domain of the Western society and only just failed to make themselves masters of the whole. As it was, they took and held northwest Africa, the Iberian Peninsula, and Gallic Gothia, the coast of Languedoc between the Pyrenees and the mouth of the Rhone, and a century and a half later, when our nascent Western civilization suffered a relapse after the breakdown of the Carolingian Empire. The Muslims took the offensive again from an African base of operations and this time only just failed to make themselves masters of Italy. Thereafter, when the Western civilization had surmounted the danger of premature ex tinction and had entered upon a vigorous growth, while the would-be Islamic world state was declining towards its fall, the tables were turned. The Westerners took the offensive along a front which extended from end to end of the Mediterranean, from the Iberian Peninsula through Sicily to the Syrian Terra d'Utre Mer, and Islam, at Attacked simultaneously by the Crusaders on one side and by the Central Asian nomads on the other, was driven to bay, as Christendom had been driven some centuries earlier when it had been compelled to face simultaneous attacks on two fronts from the North European barbarians and from the Arabs. In that life and death struggle, Islam, like Christendom before it, triumphantly survived. The Central Asian invaders were converted, the Frankish invaders were expelled, and, in territorial terms, the only enduring result of the Crusades was the incorporation in the Western world of the two outlying Islamic territories of Sicily and Anda. Lucia. Of course, the enduring economic and cultural results of the Crusaders' temporary political acquisitions from TSKM were far more important. Economically and culturally, conquered Islam took her savage conquerors captive and introduced the arts of civilization into the rustic life of Latin Christendom. In certain fields of activity, such as architecture, this Islamic influence pervaded the entire Western world in its so-called medieval age, and in the two permanently conquered territories of Sicily and Andalusia the Islamic influence upon the local Western successor states of the Arab Empire was naturally still more wide and deep. Yet this was not the last act in the play, for the attempt made by the medieval West to exterminate Islam failed as signally as the Arab Empire builders' attempt to capture the cradle of a nascent Western civilization had failed before, and, once more, a counter-attack was provoked by the unsuccessful offensive. This time Islam was represented by the Ottoman descendants of the converted Central Asian nomads, who conquered and reunited the domain of Orthodox Christendom and then attempted to extend this empire into a world state on the Arab and Roman pattern. After the final failure of the Crusades, Western Christendom stood on the defensive against this Ottoman attack during the late medieval and early modern ages of Western history and this not only on the old maritime front in the Mediterranean but on a new continental front in the Danube Basin. These defensive tactics, however, were not so much a confession of weakness as a masterly piece of half-unconscious strategy on the grand scale, for the Westerners managed to bring the Ottoman offensive to a halt without employing more than a small part of their energies, and, while half the energies of Islam were being absorbed in this local border warfare, the Westerners were putting forth their strength to make themselves masters of the ocean and thereby potential masters of the world. Thus they not only anticipated the Muslims in the discovery and occupation of America, they also entered into the Muslims' prospective heritage in Indonesia, India, and tropical Africa. And finally, having encircled the Islamic world and cast their net about it, they proceeded to attack their old adversary in his native this local border warfare, Basin. These defensive tactics, however, were not so much a confession of weakness as a masterly piece of half-unconscious strategy on the grand scale, for the Westerners managed to bring the Ottoman offensive to a halt without employing more than a small part of their energies, and, 
while half the energies of Islam were being absorbed in. This local border warfare, the Westerners were putting forth their strength to make themselves masters of the ocean and thereby potential masters of the world. Thus they not only anticipated the Muslims in the discovery and occupation of America, they also entered into the Muslims' perspective heritage in Indonesia, India, and tropical Africa. And finally, having encircled the Islamic world and cast their net about it, they proceeded to attack their old adversary in his native lair. This concentric attack of the modern West upon the Islamic world has inaugurated the present encounter between the two civilizations. It will be seen that this is part of a still larger and more ambitious movement, in which the Western civilization is aiming at nothing less than the incorporation of all mankind in a single, great society, and the control of everything in the earth, air, and sea which mankind can turn to account by means of modern Western technique. What the West is doing now to Islam, it is doing simultaneously to the other surviving civilizations the Orthodox Christian, the Hindu, and the Far Eastern world and to the surviving primitive societies, which are now at bay even in their last strongholds in tropical Africa. Thus the contemporary encounter between Islam and the West is not only more active and intimate than any phase of their contact in the past, it is also distinctive in being an incident in an attempt by Western men to westernize the world an enterprise which will possibly rank as the most momentous, and almost certainly as the most interesting, feature in the history even of a generation that has lived through two world wars. Thus Islam is once more facing the West with her back to the wall, but this time the odds are more heavily against her than they were even at the most critical moment of the Crusades, for the modern West is superior to her not only in arms but also in the technique of economic life, on which military science ultimately depends, and above all in spiritual culture the inward force which alone creates and sustains the outward manifestations of what is called civilization. Whenever one civilized society finds itself in this dangerous situation vis a vis another, there are two alternative ways open to it of responding to the challenge, and we can see obvious examples of both these types of response in the reaction of Islam to Western pressure today. It is legitimate as well as convenient to apply to the present situation certain terms which were coined when a similar situation once arose in the encounter between the ancient civilizations of Greece and Syria. Under the impact of Hellenism during the centuries immediately before and after the beginning of the Christian era, the Jews, and, we might add, the Iranians and the Egyptians, split into two parties. Some became zealots and others Herodians. The zealot is the man who takes refuge from the unknown in the familiar, and when he joins battle with a stranger who practices superior tactics and employs formidable newfangled weapons, and finds himself getting the worst of the encounter, he responds by practicing his own traditional art of war with abnormally scrupulous exactitude. Zelotism, in fact, may be described as archaism evoked by foreign pressure, and its most conspicuous representatives in the contemporary Islamic world are Puritans like the North African Sanusis and the Central Arabian Wahhabis. The first point to notice about these Islamic zealots is that their strongholds lie in sterile and sparsely populated regions which are remote from the main international thoroughfares of the modern world and which have been unattractive to Western enterprise until the recent dawn of the Oil Age. The exception which proves the rule up to date is the Mahdiist movement which dominated the Eastern Sudan from 1883 to 1898. The Sudanese Mahdi, Muhammad Ahmed, established himself astride the waterway of the Upper Nile after Western enterprise had taken the opening up of Africa in hand. In this awkward geographical position the Sudanese Mahdi's Khalfa collided with a Western power and pitting archaic weapons against modern ones was utterly overthrown. We may compare the Mahdi's career with the ephemeral triumph of the Maccabees during the brief relaxation of pressure from Hellenism which the Jews enjoyed after the Romans had overthrown the Seleucid power and before they had taken its place, and we may infer that, as the Romans overthrew the Jewish zealots in the first and second centuries of the Christian era, so some great power of the Western world of today let us say, the United States could overthrow the Wahhabis now any time it chose if the Wahhabis zealot ism became a sufficient nuisance to make the trouble of suppressing it seem worthwhile. Suppose, for instance, 
that the Saudi Arabian government, under pressure from its fanatical henchmen, were to demand exorbitant terms for oil concessions, or were to prohibit altogether the exploitation of its oil resources. The recent discovery of this hidden wealth beneath her arid soil is decidedly a menace to the independence of Arabia, for the West has now learned how to conquer the desert by bringing into play its own technical inventions railroads and armored cars, tractors that can crawl like centipedes over sand dunes, and aeroplanes that can skim above them like vultures. Indeed, in the Moroccan Rip and Atlas and on the northwest frontier of India during the interwar years, the West demonstrated its ability to subdue a type of Islamic zealot who is much more formidable to deal with than the denizen of the desert. In these mountain fastnesses the French and British have encountered and defeated a Highlander who has obtained possession of modern Western small arms and has learned to a nicety how to use them on his own ground to the best advantage. But of course the zealot armed with a smokeless quick-firing rifle is no longer the zealot pure and undefiled, for, in as much as he has adopted the Westerner's weapon, he has set foot upon unhallowed ground. No doubt if ever he thinks about it and that is perhaps seldom, for the zealot's behavior is essentially irrational and instinctive he says in his heart that he will go thus far and no farther. That, having adopted just enough of the Westerner's military technique to keep any aggressive Western power at arm's length, he will consecrate the liberty thus preserved to the keeping of the law in every other respect and will thereby continue to win God's blessing for himself and for his offspring. This state of mind may be illustrated by a conversation which took place in the 1920s between the Zaidi Imam Yahya of Sanay and a British envoy whose mission was to persuade the Imam to restore peacefully a portion of the British Aden Protectorate which he had occupied during the General War of 1914-18 and had refused to evacuate thereafter, notwithstanding the defeat of his Ottoman overlords. In a final interview with the Imam, after it had become apparent that the mission would not attain its object, the British envoy, wishing to give the conversation another turn, complimented the imam upon the soldierly appearance of his new model army. Seeing that the imam took the compliment in good part, he went on, and I suppose you will be adopting other western institutions as well. I think not, said the imam with a smile. Oh, really? That interests me. And may I venture to ask your reasons? Well, I don't think I should like other Western institutions, said the Imam. Indeed? And what institutions, for example? Well, there are parliaments, said the Imam. I like to be the government myself. I might find a parliament tiresome. Why, as for that, said the Englishman, I can assure you that responsible parliamentary representative govern. Ment is not an indispensable part of the apparatus of Western civilization. Look at Italy. She has given that up, and she is one of the great Western powers. Well, then there is alcohol, said the Imam, I don't want to see that introduced into my country, where at present it is happily almost unknown. Very natural, said the Englishman, but, if it comes to that, I can assure you that alcohol is not an indispensable adjunct of Western civilization either. Look at America. She has given up that, and she too is one of the great Western powers. Well, anyhow, said the Imam, with another smile which seemed to intimate that the conversation was at an end, I don't like parliaments and alcohol and that kind of THMG. The Englishman could not make out whether there was. Any suggestion of humor in the parting smile with which the last five words were uttered, but, however that might be, those words went to the heart of the matter and showed that the inquiry about possible further Western innovations at San A had been more pertinent than the Imam might have cared to admit. Those words indicated, in fact, that the Imam, viewing Western civilization from a great way off, saw it, in that distant perspective, as something one and indivisible and recognized certain features of it, which to a Westerner's eye would appear to have nothing whatever to do with one another, as being organically re-lated parts of that indivisible whole. Thus, on his own tacit admission, the Imam, in adopting the rudiments of the Western military technique, 
had introduced into the life of his people the thin end of a wedge which in time would inexorably cleave their close compacted traditional Islamic civilization asunder. He had started a cultural revolution, which would leave the Yamanites, in the end, with no alternative but to cover their nakedness with a complete ready-made outfit of Western clothes. If the Imam had met his Hindu contemporary Mr. Gandhi, that is what he would have been told, and such a prophecy would have been supported by what had happened already to other Islamic peoples who had exposed themselves to the insidious process of westernization several generations earlier. This, again, may be illustrated by a passage from a report on the state of Egypt in 1839 which was prepared for Lord Palmerston by Dr. John Boring on the eve of one of the perpetual crises in the eastern question of western diplomacy and towards the close of the career of Mermd al, an Ottoman statesman who, by that time, had been governing Egypt and systematically westernizing the life of the inhabitants of Egypt, for 35 years. In the course of this report, Dr. Boring records the at first sight extraordinary fact that the only maternity hospital for Muslim women which then existed in Egypt was to be found within the bounds of Mermdal's naval arsenal at Alexandria, and he proceeds to unravel the cause. Mermdal wanted to play an independent part in international affairs. The first requisite for this was an effective army and navy. An effective navy meant a navy built on the Western model of the day. The Western technique of naval architecture could only be practiced and imparted by experts imported from Western countries, but such experts were unwilling to take service with the Pasha of Egypt, even on generous financial terms, unless they were assured of adequate provision for the welfare of their families and their subordinates according to the standards to which they were accustomed in their Western homes. One fundamental condition of welfare, as they understood it, was medical attendance by trained Western practitioners. Accordingly, no hospital, no arsenal, and therefore a hospital with a Western staff was attached to the arsenal from the beginning. The Western colony at the arsenal, however, was small in numbers, the hospital staff were consumed by that devouring energy with which the Franks had been cursed by God, the natives of Egypt were legion, and maternity cases are the commonest of all in the ordinary practice of medicine. The process by which a maternity hospital for Egyptian women grew up within the precincts of a naval arsenal managed by Western experts is thus made clear. This brings us to a consideration of the alternative response to the challenge of pressure from an alien civilization, for, if the Imam Yahya of Sanay may stand for a representative of Zalatism in modern Islam, at least, of a Zalatism tempered by a belief in keeping his powder dry, Mermd Al was a representative of Herodianism whose genius entitles him to rank with the eponymous hero of the sect. Mermd Al was not actually the first Herodian to arise in Islam. He was, however, the first to take the Herodian course with impunity, after it had been the death of the one Muslim statesman who had anticipated him, the unfortunate Ottoman Sultan Salim III. Mermd Al was also the first to pursue the Herodian course steadily with substantial success in contrast to the checkered career of his contemporary and suzerain at Constantinople, Sultan Mahmud II. The Herodian is the man who acts on the principle that the most effective way to guard against the danger of the unknown is to master its secret, and, when he finds himself in the predicament of being confronted by a more highly skilled and better armed opponent, he responds by discard his traditional art of war and learning to fight his enemy with the enemy's own tactics and own weapons. If Zalatism is a form of archaism evoked by foreign pressure, Herodianism is a form of cosmopolitanism evoked by the self-same external agency, and it is no accident that, whereas the strongholds of modern Islamic Zalatism have lain in the inhospitable steppes and oases of Najd and the Sahara, modern Islamic Herodianism which was generated by the same forces at about the same time, rather more than a century and a half ago has been focused, since the days of Salim III and Mermdal, at Constantinople and Cairo. Geographically, Constantinople and Cairo represent the opposite extreme, in the domain of modern Islam, to the Wahhabis capital at Riyadh on the steppes of the Najd and to the Sanusi's stronghold at Kufara. The oases that have been the fastnesses of Islamic Zalatism are conspicuously inaccessible, 
the cities that have been the nurseries of Islamic Herodianism lie on, or close to, the great natural international thoroughfares of the Black Sea Straits and the Isthmus of Suez, and for this reason, as well as on account of the strategic importance and economic wealth of the two countries of which they have been the respective capitals, Cairo and Constantinople have exerted the strongest attraction upon Western enterprise of all kinds, ever since the modern West began to draw its net close round the citadel of Islam. It is self-evident that Herodianism is by far the more effective of the two alternative responses which may be evoked in a society that has been thrown on the defensive by the impact of an alien force in superior strength. The zealot tries to take cover in the past, like an ostrich burying its head in the sand to hide from its pursuers, the Herodian courageously faces the present and explores the future. The zealot acts on instinct, the Herodian by reason. In fact, the Herodian has to make a combined effort of intellect and will in order to overcome the zealot impulse, which is the normal first spontaneous reaction of human nature to the challenge confronting zealot and Herodian alike. To have turned Herodian is in itself a mark of character, though not necessarily of an amiable character, and it is noteworthy that the Japanese, who, of all the non-Western peoples that the modern West has challenged, have been perhaps the least unsuccessful exponents of Herodianism in the world so far, were the most effective exponents of Zelotism previously, from the 1630s to the 1860s. Being people of strong character, the Japanese made the best that could be made out of the zealots' response, and for the same reason, when the hard facts ultimately convinced them that a persistence in this response would lead them into disaster, they deliberately veered about and proceeded to sail their ship on the Herodian tack. Nevertheless, Herodianism, though it is an incomparably more effective response than zealotism to the inexorable Western question that confronts the whole contemporary world, does not really offer a solution. For one thing, it is a dangerous game, for, to vary our metaphor, it is a form of swapping horses while crossing a stream, and the rider who fails to find his seat in the new saddle is swept off by the current to a death as certain as that which awaits the zealot when, with spear and shield, he charges a machine gun. The crossing is perilous, and many there be that perish by the way. In Egypt and Turkey, for example the two countries which have served the Islamic pioneers of Herodianism as the fields for their experiment the Epigoni proved unequal to the extraordinarily diify cult task which the elder statesmen had bequeathed to them. The consequence was that in both countries the Herodian movement fell on evil days less than a hundred years after its initiation, that is to say, in the earlier years of the last quarter of the 19th century, and the stunt and retarding effect of the setback is still painfully visible, in different forms, in the life of both countries. Two still more serious, because inherent, weaknesses of Herodianism may be discerned if we turn our attention to Turkey as she is today, when her leaders, after overcoming the Hamidian setback by a heroic tour de force, have carried Herodianism to its logical conclusion in a revolution which, for ruthless thoroughness, puts even the two classical Japanese revolutions of the 7th and the 19th centuries into the shade. Here, in Turkey, is a revolution which, instead of confining itself to a single plane, like our successive economic and political and aesthetic and religious revolutions in the West, has taken place on all these planes simultaneously and has thereby convulsed the whole life of the Turkish people from the heights to the depths of social experience and activity. The Turks have not only changed their constitution, a relatively simple business, at least in respect of constitutional forms, but this unfledged Turkish Republic has deposed the defender of the Islamic faith and abolished his office, the Caliphate, disendowed the Islamic Church, and dissolved the monasteries, removed the veil from women's faces, with the repudiation of all that the veil implied, compelled the male sex to confound themselves with unbelievers by wearing hats with brims which make it impossible for the wearer to perform the complete traditional Islamic prayer drill by touching the floor of the mosque with his forehead, made a clean sweep of the Islamic law by translating the Swiss civil code into Turkish verbatim and the Italian criminal code with adaptations, and then bringing both codes into force by a vote of the National Assembly, 
and exchanged the Arabic script for the Latin, a change which could not be carried through without jettisoning the greater part of the old Ottoman. Literary Heritage Most noteworthy and most audacious change of all, these Herodian revolutionaries in Turkey have placed before their people a new social ideal inspiring them to set their hearts no longer, as before, on being husbandmen and warriors and rulers of men, but on going into commerce and industry and proving that, when they try, they can hold their own against the Westerner himself, as well as against the Westernized Greek, Armenian, or Jew, in activities in which they have formerly disdained to compete because they have traditionally regarded them as despicable. This Herodian revolution in Turkey has been carried through with such spirit, under such serious handicaps and against such heavy odds, that any generous-minded observer will make allowances for its blunders and even for its crimes and will wish it success in its formidable task. Tantus labor non sit casus and it would be particularly ungracious in a Western observer to cavil or scoff, for, after all, these Turkish Herodians have been trying to turn their people and their country into something which, since Islam and the West first met, we have always denounced them for not being by nature, they have been trying, thus late in the day, to produce replicas, in Turkey, of a Western nation and a Western state. Yet, as soon as we have clearly realized the goal, we cannot help wondering whether all this labor and travail that has been spent on striving to reach it has been really worthwhile. Certainly we did not like the outrageous old-fashioned Turkish zealot who flouted us in the posture of the Pharisee thanking God daily that he was not as other men were. So long as he prided himself on being a peculiar people we set ourselves to humble his pride by making his peculiarity odious, and so we called him the unspeakable Turk until we pierced his psychological armor and goaded him into that Herodian revolution which he has now consummated under our eyes. Yet now that, under the goad of our censure, he has changed his tune and has searched out every means of making himself indistinguishable from the nations around him, we are embarrassed and even inclined to be indignant as Samuel was when the Israelites confessed the vulgarity of their motive for de siring a king. In the circumstances, this new complaint of ours against the Turk is ungracious, to say the least. The victim of our censure might retort that, whatever he does, he cannot do right in our eyes, and he might quote against us, from our own scriptures, we have piped unto you and ye have not danced, we have mourned to you and ye have not wept. Yet it does not follow that, because our criticism is ungracious, it is also merely capped eus or altogether beside the mark. For what, after all, will be added to the heritage of civilization if this labor proves to have been not in vain and if the aim of these thoroughgoing Turkish Herodians is achieved in the fullest possible measure? It is at this point that the two inherent weaknesses of Herodianism reveal themselves. The first of them is that Herodianism is, ex hypothesi, mimetic and not creative, so that, even if it succeeds, it is apt simply to enlarge the quantity of the machine-made products of the imitated society instead of releasing new creative energies in human souls. The second weakness is that this uninspiring success, which is the best that Herodianism has to offer, can bring salvation even mere salvation in this world only to a small minority of any community which takes the Herodian path. The majority cannot look forward even to becoming passive members of the imitated civilization's ruling class. Their destiny is to swell the ranks of the imitated civilization's proletariat. Mussolini once acutely remarked that there are proletarian nations as well as proletarian classes and individuals, and this is evidently the category into which the non-Westem peoples of the contemporary world are likely to enter, even if, by a tour de force of Herodianism, they succeed outwardly in trans. Forming their countries into sovereign independent national states on the Western pattern and become associated with their Western sisters as nominally free and equal members of an all-embracing international society. Thus, in considering the subject of this paper the influence which the present encounter between Islam and the West may be expected to have on the future of mankind we may ignore both the Islamic zealot and the Islamic Herodian in so far as they carry their respective reactions through to such measure of success as is open to them, for their utmost possible success is the negative achievement of material survival.
the rare zealot who escapes extermination becomes the fossil of a civilization which is extinct as a living force, the rather less infrequent Herodian who escapes submergence becomes a mimic of the living civilization to which he assimilates himself. Neither the one nor the other is in a position to make any creative contribution to this living civilization's further growth. We may note incidentally that, in the modern encounter of Islam with the West, the Herodian and Zealot reactions have several times actually collided with each other and to some extent cancelled each other out. The first use which Mermd all made of his new westernized army was to attack the Wahhabis and quell the first outburst of their zeal. Two generations later, it was the uprising of the Model against the Egyptian regime in the eastern Sudan that gave the coup de grace to the first Herodian effort. To make Egypt into a power capable of standing politically on her own feet under the strenuous conditions of the modern world, for it was this that confirmed the British military occupation of 1882, with all the political consequences which have flowed therefrom since then. Again, in our time, the decision of the late king of Afghanistan to break with the tradition of Zelotism which had previously been the keynote of Afghan policy since the first Anglo-Afghan War of 1838-42 has probably decided the fate of the Zealot tribesmen along the northwest frontier of India. For though King Amanallah's impatience soon cost him his throne and evoked a Zealot reaction among his former subjects, it is fairly safe to prophesy that his successors will travel more surely because more slowly along the same Herodian path. And the progress of Herodianism in Afghanistan spells the tribesmen's doom. So long as these tribesmen had behind them an Afghanistan which cultivated as a policy that reaction towards the pressure of the West which the tribesmen themselves had adopted by instinct, they themselves could continue to take the zealots course with impunity. Now that they are caught between two fires on the one side from India as before, and on the other side from an Afghanistan which has taken the first steps along the Herodian path the tribesmen seem likely sooner or later to be confronted with a choice between conformity and extermination. It may be noted, in passing, that the Herodian, when he does collide with the zealot of his own household, is apt to deal with him much more ruthlessly than the westerner would have the heart to do. The Westerner chastises the Islamic zealot with whips, the Islamic Herodian chastises him with scorpions. The frightfulness with which King Amanallah suppressed his Puthan rebellion in 1924, and President Mustafa Kemal Atatürk his Kurdish rebellion in 1925, stands out in striking contrast to the more humane methods by which, at that very time, other recalcitrant. Kurds were being brought to heel in what was then the British-mandated territory of Iraq and other Puthans in the northwest frontier province of what was then British India. To what conclusion does our investigation lead us? Are we to conclude that, because, for our purpose, both the successful Islamic Herodian and the successful Islamic zealot are to be ignored, the present encounter between Islam and the West will have on the future of mankind no influence whatsoever? By no means, for, in dismissing from consideration the successful Herodian and Zealot, we have only disposed of a small minority of the members of the Islamic society. The destiny of the majority, it has already been suggested above, is neither to be exterminated nor to be fossilized nor to be assimilated, but to be submerged by being enrolled in that vast, cosmopolitan ubiquitous proletariat which is one of the most portentous byproducts of the westernization of the world. At first sight it might appear that, in thus envisaging the future of the majority of Muslims in a westernized world, we had completed the answer to our question, and this in the same sense as before. If we convict the Herodian Muslim and the zealot Muslim of cultural sterility, must we not convict the proletarian Muslim of the same fatal defect of fortiori? Indeed, is there anyone who would dissent from that verdict on first thoughts? We can imagine arch Herodians like the late President Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and arch zealots like the Grand Sanusi concur. Ring with enlightened Western colonial administrators like the late Lord Cromer or General Lyotta to exclaim with one accord, can any creative co contribution to the civilization of the future be expected from the Egyptian Fala or the Constantinopolitan Hamal? Just so, in the early years of the Christian era, when Syria was feeling the pressure 
of Greece, Herod Antipas, and Gamaliel and those zealous Theodosias and Judases who, in Gamaliel's memory, had perished by the sword, would almost certainly have concurred with a Greek poet in Partibus Orientalin like Meliager of Gadara, or a Roman provincial governor like Gallio, in asking, in the same satirical tone, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now when the question is put in that historic form, we have no doubt as to the answer, because the Greek and Syrian civilizations have both run their course and the story of their relations is known to us from beginning to end. The answer is so familiar now that it requires a certain effort of the imagination for us to realize how surprising and even shocking this particular verdict of history would have been to intelligent Greeks and Romans and Egemeans and Jews of the generation in which the question was originally asked. For although, from their profoundly different standpoints, they might have agreed in hardly anything else, they would almost certainly have agreed in answering that particular question with an emphatic and contemptuous no in the light of history, we perceive that their answer would have been ludicrously wrong if we take as our criterion of goodness the manifestation of creative power. In that Pamuxia which arose from the intrusion of the Greek civilization upon the civilizations of Syria and Iran and Egypt and Babylonia and India, the proverbial sterility of the hybrid seems to have descended upon the dominant class of the Hellenic society as well as upon those Orientals who followed out to the end the alternative Herodian and Zealot courses. The one sphere in which this Greco oriental cosmopolitan society was undoubtedly exempted from that course was the underworld of the oriental proletariat, of which Nazareth was one type and symbol. And from this underworld, under these apparently adverse conditions, there came forth some of the mightiest creations hitherto achieved by the spirit of man, a cluster of higher religions. Their sound has gone forth into all lands, and it is still echoing in our ears. Their names are names of power, Christianity and Mitraism and Monichism, the worship of the mother and her dying and rising husband son under the alternative names of Cybisis and Adis Osiris, the worship of the heavenly bodies, and the Mahayana school of Buddhism, which changing, as it traveled, from a philosophy into a religion under Iranian and Syrian influence irradiated the Far East with Indian thought embodied in a new art of Greek inspiration. If these precedents have any significance for us and they are the only beams of light which we can bring to bear upon the darkness that shrouds our own future they portend that Islam, in entering into the proletarian underworld of our latter day Western civilization, may eventually compete with India and the Far East and Russia for the prize of influencing the future in ways that may pass our understanding. Indeed, under the impact of the West, the great deeps of Islam are already stirring, and even in these early days we can discern certain spiritual movements which might conceivably become the embryos of new higher religions. The Baha'i and Ahmadi movements, which, from Acre and Lahore, have begun to send out their missionaries to Europe and America, will occur to the contemporary Western observer's mind, but at this point of prognostication we have reached our pillars of Hercules, where the prudent investigator stays his course and refrains from at tempting to sail out into an ocean of future time in which he can take no more than the most general bearings. While we can speculate with profit on the general shape of things to come, we can foresee the precise shadows of particular coming events only a very short way ahead, and those historical precedents which we have taken as our guiding lights inform us that the religions which are generated when civilizations clash take many centuries to grow to maturity and that, in a race that is so long drawn out, a dark horse is often the winner. Six and a half centuries separated the year in which Constantine gave public patronage to Christianity from the year in which the Hellespont had been crossed by Alexander the Great, five and a half centuries separated the age of the first Chinese pilgrims to the Buddhist holy land in Bihar from that of Menander, the Greek ruler of Hin. Dustin who put to Indian Buddhist sages the question, what is truth? The present impact of the West on Islam, which began to make its pressure felt little more than a hundred and fifty years ago, is evidently unlikely, on these analogies, to produce comparable effects within any time that falls within the range of our powers of precise pre-vision, and therefore any attempt to forecast such possible effects might be an unprofitable exercise of the fancy. We can, however, 
discern certain principles of Islam which, if brought to bear on the social life of the new cosmopolitan proletariat, might have important salutary effects on the great society in a nearer future. Two conspicuous sources of danger one psychological and the other material in the present relations of this cosmopolitan proletariat with the dominant element in our modem western society are race consciousness and alcohol, and in the struggle with each of these evils the Islamic spirit has a service to render which might prove, if it were accepted, to be of high moral and social value. The extinction of race consciousness as between Muslims is one of the outstanding moral achievements of Islam, and in the contemporary world there is, as it happens, a crying need for the propagation of this Islamic virtue, for, although the record of history would seem on the whole, to show that race consciousness has been the exception and not the rule in the constant interbreeding of the human species, it is a fatality of the present situation that this consciousness is felt and felt strongly by the very peoples which, in the competition of the last four centuries be between several Western powers, have won at least for the moment the lion's share of the inheritance of the earth. Though in certain other respects the triumph of the English-speaking peoples may be judged, in retrospect, to have been a blessing to mankind, in this perilous matter of race feeling it can hardly be denied that it has been a miss. Fortune. The English-speaking nations that have established themselves in the new world overseas have not, on the whole, been good mixers. They have mostly swept away their primitive predecessors, and, where they have either allowed a primitive population to survive, as in South Africa, or have imported primitive manpower from else. Where, as in North America, they have developed the rudiments of that paralysing institution which in India where in the course of many centuries it has grown to its full stature we have learned to deplore under the name of caste. Moreover, the alternative to extermination or segregation has been exclusion a policy which averts the danger of internal schism in the life of the community which practices it, but does so at the price of producing a not less dangerous state of international tension between the excluding and the excluded races especially when this policy is applied to representatives of alien races who are not primitive but civilized, like the Hindus and Chinese and Japanese. In this respect, then, the triumph of the English-speaking peoples has imposed on mankind a race question which would hardly have arisen, or at least hardly in such an acute form and over so wide an area, if the French, for example, and not the English, had been victorious in the 18th century struggle for the possession of India and North America. As things are now, the exponents of racial intolerance are in the ascendant, and, if their attitude towards the race question prevails, it may eventually provoke a general catastrophe. Yet the forces of racial toleration, which at present seem to be fighting a losing battle in a spiritual struggle of immense importance to mankind, might still regain the upper hand if any strong influence militating against race consciousness that has hitherto been held in reserve were now to be thrown into the scales. It is conceivable that the spirit of Islam might be the timely reinforcement which would decide this issue in favor of tolerance and peace. As for the evil of alcohol, it is at its worst among primitive populations in tropical regions which have been opened up by Western enterprise, and, though the more enlightened part of Western public opinion has long been conscious of this evil and has exerted itself to combat it, its power of effective action is rather narrowly limited. Western public opinion can only take action in such a matter by bringing its influence to bear upon Western administrators of the tropical dependencies of Western powers, and, while benevolent administrative action in this sphere has been strengthened by international conventions, and these are now being consolidated and extended under the auspices of the United Nations, the fact remains that even the most statesmanlike preventive measures imposed by external authority are incapable of liberating a community from a social vice unless a desire for liberation and a will to carry this desire into voluntary action on its own part are awakened in the hearts of the people concerned. Now Western administrators, at any rate those of Anglo-Saxon origin, are spiritually isolated from their native wards by the physical color bar which their race consciousness sets up, the conversion of the native soul is a task to which their competence can hardly be expected to extend, and it is at this point that Islam may have a part to play.
In these recently and rapidly opened up tropical territories, the Western civilization has produced an economic and political plenum and, in the same breath, a social and spiritual void. The frail customary institutions of the primitive societies which were formerly at home in the land have been shattered to pieces by the impact of the ponderous Western machine, and millions of native men, women, and children, suddenly deprived of their traditional social environment, have been left spiritually naked and abashed. The more liberal-minded and intelligent of the Western administrators have lately realized the vast extent of the psychological destruction which the process of Western penetration has unintentionally but inevitably caused, and they are now making sympathetic efforts to save what can still be saved from the wreck of the native social heritage, and even to reconstruct artificially, on firmer foundations, certain valuable native institutions which have been already overthrown. Yet the spiritual void in the native soul has been, and still remains, a great abyss, the proposition that nature abhors a vacuum is as true in the spiritual world as in the material, and the western civilization, which has failed to fill this spiritual vacuum, itself, has placed at the disposal of any other spiritual forces which may choose to take the field an incomparable system of material means of communication. In two of these tropical regions, Central Africa and Indonesia, Islam is the spiritual force which has taken advantage of the opportunity thus thrown open by the Western pioneers of material civilization to all comers on the spiritual plane, and, if ever the natives of these regions succeed in recapturing a spiritual state in which they are able to call their souls their own, it may prove to have been the Islamic spirit that has given fresh form to the void. This spirit may be expected to manifest itself in many practical ways, and one of these manifestations might be a liberation from alcohol which was inspired by religious conviction and which was therefore able to accomplish what could never be enforced by the external sanction of an alien law. Here, then, in the foreground of the future, we can remark two valuable influences which Islam may exert upon the cosmopolitan proletariat of a Western society that has cast its net round the world and embraced the whole of mankind, while in the more distant future we may speculate on the possible contributions of Islam to some new manifestation of religion. These several possibilities, however, are all alike contingent upon a happy outcome of the situation in which mankind finds itself today. They presuppose that the discordant Pamuxia set up by the Western conquest of the world will gradually and peacefully shape itself into a harmonious synthesis out of which, centuries hence, new creative variations might again gradually and peacefully arise. This presupposition, however, is merely an unverifiable assumption which may or may not be justified by the event. A Pamuxia may end in a synthesis, but it may equally well end in an explosion, and, in that disaster, Islam might have quite a different part to play as the active ingredient in some violent reaction of the cosmopolitan underworld against its western masters. At the moment, it is true, this destructive possibility does not appear to be imminent, for the impressive word pan-Islamism which has been the bugbear of western colonial administrators since it was first given currency by the policy of Sultan Abd al-Hamid has lately been losing such hold as it may ever have obtained over the minds of Muslims. The inherent difficulties of conducting a pan-Islamic movement are, indeed, plain to see. Pan-Islamism is simply a manifestation of that instinct which prompts a herd of buffalo, grazing scattered over the plain, to form a phalanx, heads down and horns outward, as soon as an enemy appears within range. In other words, it is an example of that reversion to traditional tactics in face of a superior and unfamiliar opponent, to which the name of Zelotism has been given in this paper. Psychologically, therefore, pan-Islamism should appeal par excellence to Islamic zealots in the Wahhabi or Sanusi vein, but this psychological predisposition is balked by a technical difficulty, for in a society that is dispersed abroad, as Islam is, from Morocco to the Philippines and from the Volga to the Zambesi, the tactics of solidarity are as difficult to execute as they are easy to imagine. The herd instinct emerges spontaneously, 
but it can hardly be translated into effective action without taking advantage of the elaborate system of mechanical communications which modern Western ingenuity has conjured up, steamships, railways, telegraphs, telephones, aeroplanes, motor cars, newspapers, and the rest. Now the use of these instruments is beyond the compass of the Islamic zealot's ability, and the Islamic Herodian, who has succeeded in making himself more or less master of them, X hypothesis desires to employ them, not in captaining a holy war against the West, but in reorganizing his own life on a Western pattern. One of the most remarkable signs of the times in the contemporary Islamic world is the emphasis with which the Turkish Republic has repudiated the tradition of Islamic solidarity. We are determined to work out our own salvation, the Turks seem to say, and this salvation, as we see it, lies in learning how to stand on our own feet in the posture of an economically self-sufficient and politically independent sovereign state on the Western model. It is for other Muslims to work out their salvation for themselves as may seem good to them. We neither ask their help any longer nor offer them ours. Every people for itself, and the devil take the hindermost, Alia Franca F. Now though, since 1922, the Turks have done almost everything conceivable to flout Islamic sentiment, they have gained rather than lost prestige among other Muslims even among some Muslims who have publicly denounced the Turks' audacious course in virtue of the very SUC. Cess with which their audacities have so far been attended. And this makes it probable that the path of nationalism which the Turks are taking so decidedly today will be taken by other Muslim peoples with equal conviction tomorrow. The Arabs and the Persians are already on the move. Even the remote and hitherto zealot Afghans have set their feet on this course, and they will not be the last. In fact, nationalism, and not pan-Islamism, is the formation into which the Islamic peoples are falling, and for the majority of Muslims the inevitable, though undesired, outcome of nationalism will be submergence in the cosmopolitan proletariat of the Western world. This view of the present prospects of pan-Islamism is borne out by the failure of the attempt to resuscitate the caliphate. During the last quarter of the 19th century the Ottoman Sultan Abd al-Hamid, discovering the title of caliph in the lumber room of the Seraglio, began to make play with it as a means of rallying pan-Islamic feeling round his own person. After 1922, however, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and his companions, Finding this resuscitated caliphate incompatible with their own radically Herodian political ideas, first committed the historical solecism of equating the caliphate with spiritual as opposed to temporal power and finally abolished the office altogether. This action on the part of the Turks stimulated other Muslims, who were distressed by such high-handed treatment of a historic Muslim institution, to hold a caliphate conference at Cairo in 1926 in order to see if anything could be done to adapt a historic Muslim institution to the needs of a newfangled age. Anyone who examines the records of this conference will carry away the conviction that the caliphate is dead, and that this is so because pan-Islamism is dormant. Pan-Islamism is dormant yet we have to reckon with the possibility that the sleeper may awake if ever the cosmopolitan proletariat of a westernized world revolts against western domination and cries out for anti-western leadership. That call might have incalculable psychological effects in evoking the militant spirit of Islam even if it had slumbered as long as the seven sleepers because it might awaken echoes of a heroic age. On two historic occasions in the past, Islam has been the sign in which an oriental society has risen up victoriously against an occidental intruder. Under the first successors of the Prophet, Islam liberated Syria and Egypt from a Hellenic domination which had weighed on them for nearly a thousand years. Under Zangl and Nur ad-Din and Saladin and the Mamluks, Islam held the fort against the assaults of Crusaders and Mongols. If the present situation of mankind were to precipitate a race war, Islam might be moved to play her historic role once again. Absit OVN. Eleven encounters between civilizations I what will be singled out as the salient event of our time by future historians, centuries hence, looking back on the first half of the 20th century and trying to see its activities and experiences in that just proportion which the time perspective sometimes reveals. Not, I fancy, any. 
of those sensational or tragic or catastrophic political and economic events which occupy the headlines of our newspapers and the foregrounds of our minds, not wars, revolutions, massacres, deportations, famines, gluts, slumps, or booms, but something of which we are only half conscious, and out of which it would be difficult to make a headline. The things that make good headlines attract our attention because they are on the surface of the stream of life, and they distract our attention from the slower, impalpable, imponderable movements that work below the surface and penetrate to the depths. But of course it is really these deeper, slower movements that, in the end, make history, and it is they that stand out huge in retrospect, when the sensational passing events have dwindled, in perspective, to their true proportions. Mental perspective, like optical perspective, comes into focus only when the observer has put a certain distance between himself and his object. When, for example, you are traveling by air from Salt Lake City to Denver, the nearest view of the Rockies is not the best one. While you are actually over the mountains, you see nothing but a maze of peaks, ridges, gullies, and crags. It is not until you have left the mountains behind you and are looking back at them as you fly over the plains that they rise up before you in their magnificent order, range behind range. It is only then that you have a vision of the Rockies themselves. With this vision in my mind, I believe that future historians will be able to see our age in better proportion than we can. What are they likely to say about it? Future historians will say, I think, that the great event of the 20th century was the impact of the Western civilization upon all the other living societies of the world of that day. They will say of this impact that it was so powerful and so pervasive that it turned the lives of all its victims upside down and inside out affecting the behavior, outlook, feelings, and beliefs of individual men, women, and children in an intimate way, touching chords in human souls that are not touched by mere external ma. Material forces however ponderous and terrifying. This will be said, I feel sure, by historians looking back on our times even from as short a time hence as A.D. 2047 what will the historians of A.D. 3047 say? If we had been living a century ago, I should have had to apologize for the fantastic conceit of pretending to speculate about anything that might be said or done at so immensely remote a date. 1100 years was a very long time for people who believed that the world had been created in 4004 EC. But I need not apologize today, for, since our great-grandfather's time, there has been so great a revolution in our time scale that, if I were to try to plot out to scale, on one of these pages, a chart of the history of this planet since its birth, I should not be able to make so short a period as 1100 years visible to the naked eye. The historians of A.D. 3047, then, may have something far more interesting than those of A.D. 2047 to say, because they, by their time, may know much more of the story of which we, today, are perhaps in a rather early chapter. The historians of A.D. 3047 will, I believe, be chiefly interested in the tremendous counter-effects which, by that time, the victims will have produced in the life of the aggressor. By A.D. 3047, our Western civilization, as we and our Western predecessors have known it, say, for the last 12 or 1300 years, since its emergence out of the Dark Ages, may have been transformed, almost out of all recognition, by a counter-radiation of influences from the foreign worlds which we, in our day, are in the act of engulfing in ours influences from Orthodox Christendom, from Islam, from Hinduism, from the Far East. By AD 4047 the distinction which looms large today between the Western civilization, as an aggressor, and the other civilizations, as its victims, will probably seem unimportant. When radiation has been followed by counter-radiation of influences, what will stand out will be a single great experience, common to the whole of mankind, the experience of having one's parochial social heritage battered to bits by collision with the parochial heritages of other civilizations, and then finding a new life a new calm. Mon life springing up out of the wreckage. 
the historians of AD 4047 will say that the impact of the Western civilization on its contemporaries, in the second half of the second millennium of the Christian era, was the epoch making event of that age because it was the first step towards the unification of mankind into one single society. By their time, the unity of mankind will perhaps have come to seem one of the fundamental conditions of human life just part of the order of nature and it may need quite an effort of imagination on their part to recall the parochial outlook of the pioneers of civilization during the first 6,000 years or so of its existence. Those Athenians, whose capital city was no more than a day's walk from the farthest frontiers of their country, and those American contemporaries or virtual contemporaries of theirs, whose country you could fly across from sea to sea in 16 hours how could they behave, as we know they did be. Have, as if their own little country were the universe? And the historians of AD 5047? The historians of AD 5047 will say, I fancy, that the importance of this social unification of mankind was not to be found in the field of technics and economics, and not in the field of war and politics, but in the field of religion. 11. Why do I venture on these prophecies about how the history of our own time will appear to people looking back at it several thousand years hence? Because we have about 6,000 years of past history to judge by, since the first emergence of human societies of the species we call civilizations. 6,000 years is an almost infinitesimally short time compared to the age of the human race, of mammals, of life on earth, of the planetary system round our sun, of the sun itself, and of the star cluster of which our sun is a not particularly conspicuous member. Still, for our present purpose, these last 6,000 years brief though they our do provide us with other examples of the phenomenon we are studying examples of encounters between different civilizations. In relation to some of these cases, we ourselves, in our day, are already enjoying the advantage which the historians living in AD 3047 or 4047 are going to have in looking back at us of knowing the whole story. It is with some of these past encounters in mind that I have been speculating on how our own encounter with our own contemporaries is likely to turn out. Take the history of one of our predecessors, the greco roman civilization, and consider how this looks to us in the fairly distant perspective in which we are now able to see it, as a result of the conquests of Alexander the Great and of the Romans, the greco roman civilization radiated over most of the Old World into India, into the British Isles, and even as far as China and Scandinavia. The only civilizations of that day which remained untouched by its influence were those of Central America and Peru, so that its expansion was not incomparable to our own in X. Tent and Vigor When we look back on the history of the Greco-Roman world during the last four centuries BC, it is this great movement of expansion and penetration that stands out now. The wars, revolutions, and economic crises that ruffled the surface of Greco-Roman history during those centuries, and occupied so much of the attention of the men and women who were struggling to live through them, do not mean much to us now compared with that great tide of Greek cultural influence invading Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, Babylonia, Persia, India, China. But why does the Greco-Roman impact on these other civilizations matter to us now? because of the counter attack of these other civilizations on the Greco-Roman world. This counter attack was partly delivered in the same style as the original Greco-Roman attack, that is, by force of arms. But we are not much interested today in the forlorn hope of Jewish armed resistance to Greek and Roman imperialism in Palestine, or in the successful counter attack of the Parthians and their Persian successors under the Sasanian dynasty east of the Euphrates, or in the sensational victories of the early Muslim Arabs, who in the 7th century of the Christian era liberated the Middle East from Greco-Roman rule in as short a number of years as it had taken Alexander the Great to conquer it a thousand years earlier. But there was another counter-attack, a non-violent one, a spiritual one, which attacked and conquered, not fortresses and provinces, but hearts and minds. 
This attack was delivered by the missionaries of new religions which had arisen in the worlds which the Greco-Roman civilization had attacked by force and submerged. The prince of these missionaries was Saint Paul, who, starting from Antioch, made the audacious march on Macedonia, Greece, and Rome which King Antiochus the Great had once attempted unsuccessfully. These religions were different in kind from the native religion of the Greco-Roman world. The gods of Greco-Roman paganism had been rooted in the soil of particular communities, they had been parochial and political, Athene Polias, Fortuna Prenestina, Dia Roma. The gods of the new religions that were making this non-violent counter-attack on Greek and Roman hearts and minds had risen above their original local origins. They had become universal gods, with a message of salvation for all mankind, Jew and Gentile, Scythian and Greek. Or, to put this great historical event in religious terms, one might say that the one true God had taken this opportunity of the opening of men's minds through the collision and collapse of their old local traditions, he had taken advantage of this excruciating experience in order to il. Luminate these momentarily open minds with a fuller and truer vision of his nature and purpose than they had been capable of receiving before. Take the two words Jesus Christ, which are so very important for us, and which, we may venture to prophesy, will still be important for mankind two or three thousand years hence. These very words are witnesses to the encounter between a Greco-Roman civilization and a Syrian civilization out of which Christianity came to birth. Jesus is the third person singular of a Semitic verb, Christ is the passive participle of a Greek verb. The double name testifies that Christianity was born into this world from a marriage between those two cultures. Consider the four higher religions, with a worldwide mission, which exist in the world today, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and the Mahayana form of Buddhism which prevails in the Far East. Al-4 are, historically, products of the encounter between the Greco-Roman civilization and its contemporaries. Christianity and Islam arose as alternative responses of the Syrian world to Greco-Roman penetration, Christianity a nonviolent response, Islam a violent one. Mahayanian Buddhism and Hinduism are the gentle and the violent responses of the Hindu world to the same Greco-Roman challenge. Looking back on Greco-Roman history today, about 1300 years after the date when the Greco-Roman civilization became extinct, we can see that, in this perspective, the most important thing in the history of the Greco-Roman world is its meeting with other civilizations, and these encounters are important, not for their immediate political and economic consequences, but for their long-term religious consequences. This Greco-Roman illustration, of which we know the whole story, also gives us some idea of the time span of encounters between civilizations. The Greco-Roman world's impact upon other contemporary civilizations, which corresponds to the modern Western world's impact on its own contemporaries since the turn of the 15th and 16th centuries, started with the conquests of Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC, and the Middle Eastern world was still translating the classical works of Greek philosophy and science some five or six centuries after the liberation of the Middle East from Greco-Roman rule by the early Muslim Arabs in the 7th century of the Christian era. From the 4th century BC to the 13th century of the Christian era, it took the best part of 1600 years for the encounter between the Greco-Roman civilization and its contemporaries to work itself out. Now measure against that span of 1600 years the duration, to date, of the encounter between our modern Western civilization and its contemporaries. One may say that this encounter began with the Ottoman attack on the homelands of the Western civilization and with the great Western voyages of discovery at the turn of the 5th. 18th and 16th centuries of our era. That makes only four and a half centuries to the present. Let us assume, if you like, that people's hearts and minds move rather faster nowadays, though I know of no evidence that the unconscious part of the human psyche ever greatly varies its pace, even so, it looks as if we were still only in an early chapter of the story of our encounter. With the civilizations of Mexico and Peru and Orthodox Christendom and Islam and the Hindu world and the Far East. We are just beginning to see some of the effects of our action on them, 
but we have hardly begun to see the effects which will certainly be tremendous of their calm. Encounter action upon us. It is only in our generation that we have seen one of the first moves in this counter-offensive, and we have found it very disturbing, whether we have liked it or not, we have felt it to be momentous. I mean, of course, the move made by the offshoot of Orthodox Christendom in Russia. It is momentous and disturbing not because of the material power behind it. The Russians, after all, do not yet possess the atom bomb, but they have already shown. Shown, and this is the point, the power to convert Western souls to a non-Western ideology. The Russians have taken up a Western secular social philosophy, Marxism, you might equally well call Marxism a Christian heresy, a yeaf torn out of the book of Chris. Tyanity and treated as if it were the whole gospel. The Russians have taken up this Western heretical religion, transformed it into something of their own, and are now shooting it back at us. This is the first shot in the anti-Western counter-offensive, but this Russian counter-discharge in the form of communism may come to seem a small affair when the probably far more potent civilizations of India and China respond in their turn to our Western challenge. In the long run India and China seem likely to produce much deeper effects on our Western life than Russia can ever hope to produce with her communism. But even the comparatively feeble native civilization of Mexico is beginning to react. The revolution through which Mexico has been passing since AD 1910 may be interpreted as a first move to shake off the top dressing of Western civilization which we imposed on Mexico in the 16th century, and what is happening today in Mexico may happen tomorrow in the seats of the native civilization of South America, in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Colombia. And before leaving off, I must say a word about one question which I have begged up to this point, and that is, what do we mean by a civilization? Clearly, we do mean some tiling, for even before we have tried to define what our meaning is, this classification of human societies, the West. And civilization, the Islamic, the Far Eastern, the Hindu, and so on, does seem to make sense. These names do call up distinct pictures in our minds in terms of religion, architecture, painting, manners, and customs. Still, it is better to try to get closer to what we mean by a term which we have already been working so hard. I believe I do know what I mean by a civilization, at least, I am sure I know how I have arrived at my own idea of it. I mean, by a civilization, the smallest unit of historical study at which one arrives when one tries to understand the history of one's own country, the United States, say, or the United Kingdom. If you were to try to understand the history of the United States by itself, it would be unintelligible, you could not understand the part played in American life by federal government, representative government, democracy, industrialism, monogamy, Christianity, unless you looked beyond the bounds of the United States, out beyond her frontiers to Western Europe and to the other overseas countries founded by West Europeans, and back beyond her local origins, to the history of Western. Europe in centuries before Columbus or Cabot had crossed the Atlantic. But, to make American history and institutions intelligible for practical purposes, you need not look beyond Western Europe into Eastern Europe or the Islamic world, nor behind the origins of our Western European civilization to the decline and fall of the Greco-Roman. Civilization these limits of time and space give us the intelligible unit of social life of which the United States or Great Britain or France or Holland is a part, call it Western Christendom, Western Civilization, Western Society, the Western World. Similarly, if you start from Greece or Serbia or Russia, and try to understand their histories, you arrive at an Orthodox Christendom or Byzantine world. If you start from Morocco or Afghanistan, and try to understand their histories, you arrive at an Islamic world. Start from Bengal or Mysore or Rajputana, and you find a Hindu world. Start from China or Japan, and you find a Far Eastern world. While the state of which we happen to be citizens makes more concrete and more imperious claims on our allegiance, care it specially in the present age, the civilization of which we pre-members really counts for more in our lives. And this civilization of which we are members includes, at most stages in its history, the citizens of other states besides our own. It is older than our own state, the Western civilization is about 1300 years old, whereas the Kingdom of England is only 1000 years old, the United Kingdom of England and Scotland less than 250, 
the United States, not much more than 150. States are apt to have short lives and sudden deaths, the Western civilization of which you and I are members may be alive centuries after the United Kingdom. And the United States have disappeared from the political map of the world like their late contemporaries, the Republic of Venice and the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. This is one of the reasons why I have been asking you to look at history in terms of civilizations, and not in terms of states, and to think of states as rather super, dinate and ephemeral political phenomena in the lives of the civilizations in whose bosoms they appear and disappear. 12. Christianity and Civilization As I was rereading my notes for this essay during the last few days, there floated into my mind the picture of a scene which was transacted in the capital of a great empire about 1400 years ago, when that capital was full of war, not a war on a front, but a war in the rear, a war of turmoil and street fighting. The emperor of that empire was holding counsel to decide whether he should carry on the struggle or whether he should take ship and sail away to safety. At the crown council his wife, the empress, was present and spoke, and she said, you, Justinian, can sail away if you like, the ship is at the quay and the sea is still open, but I am going to stay and see it out, because percent cov of tak of f, six sacredia, empire is a fine winding sheet. I thought. Of this passage and my colleague, Professor Baines, found it for me, and, as I thought of it, and also thought of the day and the circumstances in which I was writing, I decided to amend it, and I amended it to x a mavavrtov f, 6 i a rav a copyright so, a finer winding sheet is the kingdom of God, a finer because that is a winding sheet from which there is a resurrection. Now that paraphrase of a famous phrase of Greek comes, I venture to think, rather near to the three Latin words which are the motto of the University of Oxford, and, if we believe m these three words dom use luminatio mea and can live up to them, we can look forward without dismay to any future that may be coming to us. The material future is very little in our power. Storms might come which might lay low that noble and beloved building and leave not one stone upon another. But, if the truth about this university and about ourselves is told in those three Latin words, then we know for certain that, though the stones may fall, the light by which we live will not go out. Now let me come by a very easy transition to what is my subject in this essay, the relation between Christianity and civilization. This is a question which has always been at issue since the foundation of the Christian Church, and of course there have been a number of alterna. Tie views on it. One of the oldest and most persistent views is that Christianity was the destroyer of the civilization within whose framework it grew up. That was, I suppose, the view of the Emperor Marcus, as far as he was aware of the presence of Christianity in his world. It was most emphatically and violently the view of his successor the Emperor Julian, and it was also the view of the English historian Gibbon, who recorded the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Long after the event In the last chapter of Gibbon's history there is one sentence in which he sums up the theme of the whole work. Looking back, he says, one had described the triumph of barbarism and religion. And, to understand his meaning, you have to turn from the middle of chapter 71 to the opening passage of chapter 1, that extraordinarily majestic description of the Roman Empire at peace in the age of the Antonines, in the second century after. Christ. He starts you there, and at the end of the long story he says I have described the triumph of barbarism and religion, meaning that it was Christianity as well as barbarism which overthrew the civilization for which the Antonines stood. One hesitates to question Gibbon's authority, but I believe there is a fallacy in this view which vitiates the whole of it. Gibbon assumes that the Greco-Roman civilization stood at its height in the age of the Antonines, and that in tracing its decline from that moment he is tracing that decline from the beginning. Evidently, if you take that view, Christianity rises as the empire sinks, and the rise of Christianity is the fall of civilization. I think Gibbon's initial error lies in supposing that the ancient civilization of the Greco-Roman world began to decline in the second century after Christ and that the age of the Antonines was that civilization's highest point. I think it really began to decline in the fifth century before Christ. It died not by murder, but by suicide, and that act of suicide was committed before the fifth century BC. Was out. It was not even the philosophies which preceded Christianity that were responsible for the death of the ancient Greco-Roman civilization. 
The philosophies arose because the civic life of that civilization had already destroyed itself by turning itself into an idol to which men paid an exorbitant worship. And the rise of the philosophies, and the subsequent rise of the religions out of which Christianity emerged as the final successor of them all, was something that happened after the Greco-Roman civilization had already put itself to death. The rise of the philosophies, and a fortiori that of the religions, was not a cause, it was a consequence. When Gibbon, in that opening passage of his work, looks as the Roman Empire in the age of the Antonines, he does not say explicitly, but I am sure this was in his mind, that he is also thinking of himself as standing on another peak of civilization and looking back towards that distant peak in the past across a broad trough of barbarism in between. Gibbon thought to himself, on the morrow of the death of the emperor Marcus the Roman Empire went into decline. All the values that I, Gibbon, and my kind care for began then to be degraded. Religion and barbarism began to triumph. This lamentable state of affairs continued to prevail for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then, a few generations before my time, no longer ago than the close of the 17th century, a rational civilization began to emerge again. From his peak in the 18th century Gibbon looks back to the inn. Tonine peak in the 2nd century, and that view, which is, I think, implicit in Gibbon's work, has been put very clearly and sharply by a writer of the 20th century, from whom I propose to quote a passage somewhat at length, because it is, so to speak, the formal antithesis of the thesis which I want to maintain. Greek and Roman society was built on the conception of the subordination of the individual to the community, of the citizen to the state, it set the safety of the commonwealth, as the supreme aim of conduct, above the safety of the individual weather in this world or in a world to come. Trained from infancy in this unselfish ideal, the citizens devoted their lives to the public service and were ready to lay them down for the common good, or, if they shrank from the supreme sacrifice, it never occurred to them that they acted otherwise than basely in preferring their personal existence to the interests of their country. All this was changed. By the spread of Oriental religions, which inculcated the communion of the soul with God and its eternal salvation as the only objects worth living for, objects in comparison with which the prosperity and even the existence of the state sank into insignificance. The inevitable result of this selfish and immoral doctrine was to withdraw the devotee more and more from the public service, to concentrate his thoughts on his own spiritual emotions, and to breed in him a contempt for the present life, which he regarded merely as a probation for a better and an eternal. The saint and the recluse, disdainful of earth and wrapped in ecstatic contemplation of heaven, became in popular opinion the highest ideal of humanity, displacing the old ideal of the patriot and hero who, forgetful of self, lives and is ready to die for the good of his country. The earthly city seemed poor and contemptible to men whose eyes beheld the city of God coming in the clouds of heaven. Thus the center of gravity, so to say, was shifted from the present to a future life, and, however much the other world may have gained, there can be little doubt that this one lost. Heavily by the change. A general disintegration of the body, politics set in. The ties of the state and the family were loosened, the structure of society tended to resolve itself into its individual elements and thereby to relapse into barbarism, for civilization is only possible through the active cooperation of the citizens and their willing. Nest to subordinate their private interests to the common good. Men refused to defend their country and even to continue their kind. In their anxiety to save their own souls and the souls of others, they were content to leave the material world, which they identified with the principle of evil, to perish around them. This obsession lasted for a thousand years. The revival of Roman law, of the Aristotelian philosophy, of ancient art and literature at the close of the Middle Ages marked the return of Europe to native ideals of life and conduct, to saner, manlier views of the world. The long halt in the march of civilization was over. The tide of Oriental invasion had turned at last. It is ebbing still. It is ebbing indeed. And one might speculate about what the author of this passage, which was first published in 1906, would now write if he were revising his work for a fourth edition today. Many reading this article are, of course, familiar with the passage. I have not yet mentioned the author's name, but, for those who do not know it already, 
I would say that it is not Alfred Rosenberg, it is Sir James Fraser. One one wonder what that gentle scholar thinks of the latest form in which Europe's return to native ideals of life and conduct is manifesting itself. Now you will have seen that the most interesting thesis in that passage of Fraser's is the contention that trying to save one's soul is something contrary to, and incompatible with, trying to do one's duty to one's neighbor. I am going, in the course of this essay, to challenge that thesis, at the moment I merely want to point out that Fraser is at the same time putting Gibbon's thesis and stating it in explicit terms, and on this point I would give Fraser the answer that I have already ventured to give to Gibbon. That Christianity was not the destroyer of the ancient Greek civilization, because that civilization had decayed from inherent defects of its own before Christianity arose. But I would agree with Fraser, and would ask you to agree with me, that the tide of Christianity has been ebbing and that our post-Christian Western secular civilization that has. 1. Fraser, Sir J. G., The Golden Bough, Part R. V., Adonis, Addis is Osiris, Volume 1, pages 300-301, 3rd edition, London 1914, Macmillan, preface dated January, 1914. Emerged is a civilization of the same order as the pre-Christian Greco-Roman civilization. This observation opens up a second possible view of the relation between Christianity and civilization, not the same view as that held in common by Gibbon and Fraser, not the view that Christianity has been the destroyer of civilization, but an alternative view in which Christianity appears in the role of civilization's humble servant. According to this second possible view, Christianity is, as it were, the egg, grub, and chrysalis between butterfly and butterfly. Christianity is a transitional thing which bridges the gap between one civilization and another, and I confess that I myself held this rather patronizing view for many years. On this view, you look at the historical function of the Christian Church in terms of the process of the reproduction of civilizations. Civilization is a species of being which seeks to reproduce itself, and Christianity has had a useful but a subordinate role in bringing two new secular civilizations to birth after the death of their predecessor. You find the ancient Greco-Roman civilization in decline from the close of the second century after Christ onwards. And then after an interval you find, perhaps as early as the 9th century in Byzantium, and as early as the 13th century in the West in the person of the Stupermundi Frederick II, a new secular civiliza. Tyan arising out of the ruins of its Greco-Roman predecessor. And you look at the role of Christianity in the interval and conclude that Christianity is a kind of chrysalis which has held and preserved the hidden germs of life until these have been able to break out again into a new growth of secular civilization. That is an alternative view to the theory of Christianity being the destroyer of the ancient Greco-Roman civilization, and, if one looks abroad through the history of civilizations, one can see other cases which seem to conform to the same pattern. Take the other higher religions which are still living on in the world of today side by side with Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and the Mahayana form of Buddhism which now prevails in the Far East. You can see the role of Islam as a chrysalis between the ancient civilization of Israel and Iran and the modern Islamic civilization of the Near and Middle East. Hinduism, again, seems to bridge a gap in the history of civilization in India between the modern Hindu culture and the ancient culture of the Aryas, and Buddhism, likewise, seems to play the same part as a mediator between the modern history of the Far East and the history of ancient China. In that picture the Christian church would be simply one of a series of churches whose function is to serve as chrysalises to provide for the reproduction of civilizations and thus to preserve that secular species of society. Now I think there is perhaps a chrysalis-like element in the constitution of the Christian church, an institutional element that I am going to deal with later, which may have quite a different purpose from that of assisting in the reproduction of civilizations. But, before we accept at all an account of the place and role of Christianity and of the other living higher religions in social history which represents these religions as being mere instruments for assisting in the process of the reproduction of civilizations, let us go on testing the hypothesis by examining whether, in every instance of the parent and child relation between civilizations, we find a chrysalis church intervening between the parent civilization and the daughter civilization. If you look at the histories of the ancient civilizations of southwestern Asia and Egypt, you find there a rudimentary higher religion in the form of the worship of a god and a related goddess. 
I call it rudimentary because, in the worship of Tammuz and Ishtar, of Adonis and Astarte, of Addis and Sibeli, of Osiris and Isis, you are very close to the nature worship of the earth and her fruits, and I think that, here again, you can see that this rudimentary higher religion, in each of its different variants, has in every case played the historical role of filling a gap where there was a break in the continuity of secular civilization. If, however, we complete our survey, we shall find that this apparent law does not always hold good. Christianity intervenes in this way between our own civilization and the Greco-Roman one. Go back behind the Greco-Roman one and you find a Minoan civilization behind that. But between the Minoan and the Greco-Roman you do not find any higher religion corresponding to Christianity. Again, if you go back behind the ancient civilization of Aryan India, you find vestiges of a still more ancient pre-Aryan civilization in the Indus Valley which have only been excavated within the last 20 years, but here again you do not seem to find any higher religion intervening between the two. And, if you pass from the old world to the new and look at the civilization of the Mayas in Central America, which, again, has had daughter civilizations BOM from it, you do not find, here either, in the intervening period, any trace at all of any higher religion or church of the same species as Chris. Tyanity or Islam or Hinduism or Mahayanian Buddhism, nor again is there any evidence of any such chrysalis bridging the TRNC Tyan from primitive societies to the earliest known civilizations, to what we might call the first generation of civilizations, and so, when we complete our view of the whole field of civilizations, as we have now done in a very summary way, we find that the relation between higher religions and civilizations seems to differ according to the generation of the civilization with which we are dealing. We seem to find no higher religion at all between primitive societies and civilizations of the first generation, and between civilizations of the first and those of the second generation either none or only rudiments. It is between civilizations of the second and those of the third generation that the intervention of a higher religion seems to be the rule, and here only. If there is anything in this analysis of the relation between civilizations and higher religions, this suggests a third possible view of that relation which would be the exact inverse of the second view which I have just put before you. On that second view, religion is subsidiary to the reproduction of secular civilizations, and the inverse of that would be that the successive rises and falls of civilizations may be subsidiary to the growth of religion. The breakdowns and disintegrations of civilizations might be stepping stones to higher things on the religious plane. After all, one of the deepest spiritual laws that we know is the law that is proclaimed by Aeschylus in the two words JTCT and Eiaidko, it is through suffering that learning comes, and in the New Testament in the verse whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you apply that to the rise of the higher religions which has culminated in the flowering of Christianity, you might say that in the mythical passions of Thomas and Adonis and Addis and Osiris the passion of Christ was foreshadowed, and that the passion of Christ was the culminating and crowning experience of the sufferings of human souls and successive failures in the enter. Prize of Secular Civilization the Christian Church itself arose out of the spiritual travail, which was a consequence of the breakdown of the Greco-Roman civilization. Again, the Christian Church has Jewish and Zoroastrian roots, and those roots sprang from an earlier breakdown, the breakdown of Assyrian civilization, which was a sister to the Greco-Roman. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah were two of the many states of this ancient Syrian world, and it was the premature and permanent overthrow of these worldly commonwealths and the extinction of all the political hopes which had been bound up with their existence as independent polities that brought the religion of Judaism to birth and evoked the highest expression of its spirit in the Elegy of the Suffering Servant, which is appended in the Bible to the book of the prophet Isaiah. Judaism, likewise, has a mosaic route, which in its turn sprang from the withering of the second crop of the ancient Egyptian civilization. I do not know whether Moses and Abraham are historical characters, but I think it can be taken as certain that they represent historical stages of religious experience, and Moses' forefather and forerunner. Abraham received his enlightenment and his promise at the dissolution, in the 19th or 18th century before Christ, of the ancient civilization of Sumer and Akkad the earliest case, known to us, of a civilization going to ruin. These men of sorrows were precursors of Christ, and the sufferings through which they won their enlightenment were stations of the cross in anticipation of the crucifixion. 
That is, no doubt, a very old idea, but it is also an ever new one. If religion is a chariot, it looks as if the wheels on which it mounts towards heaven may be the periodic downfalls of civilizations on earth. It looks as if the movement of civilizations may be cyclic and recurrent, while the movement of religion may be on a single continuous upward line. The continuous upward movement of religion may be served and promoted by the cyclic movement of civilizations round the cycle of birth, death, birth. If we accept this conclusion, it opens up what may seem a rather startling view of history. If civilizations are the handmaids of religion and if the Greco-Roman civilization served as a good handmaid to Christianity by bringing it to birth before that civilization finally went to pieces, then the civilizations of the third generation may be vain. Repetitions of the Gentiles If, so far from its being the historical function of higher religions to minister, as chrysalises, to the cyclic process of the reproduction of civilizations, it is the historical function of civilizations to serve, by their downfalls, as stepping stones to a progressive process of the revelation of always deeper religious insight. And the gift of ever more grace to act on this insight, then the societies of the species called civilizations will have fulfilled their function when once they have brought a mature higher religion to birth, and, on this showing, our own Western post-Christian secular civilization might at best be a superfluous repetition of the pre-Christian Greco. Roman 1, and at worst a pernicious backsliding from the path of spiritual progress. In our Western world of today, the worship of Leviathan, the self-worship of the tribe, is a religion to which all of us pay some measure of allegiance, and this tribal religion is, of course, sheer idolatry. Communism, which is another of our latter-day religions, is, I think, a leaf taken from the book of Christianity, a leaf torn out and misread. Democracy is another leaf from the book of Christianity, which has also, I fear, been torn out and, while perhaps not misread, has certainly been half emptied of meaning by being divorced from its Christian context and secularized, and we have obviously, for a number of generations past, been living on spiritual capital, I mean clinging to Christian practice without possessing the Christian belief, and practice unsupported by belief is a wasting asset, as we have suddenly discovered. To our dismay, in this generation. If this self-criticism is just, then we must revise the whole of our present conception of modem history. And if we can make the effort of will and imagination to think this ingrained and familiar conception away, we shall arrive at a very different picture of the historical retrospect. Our present view of modem history focuses attention on the rise of our modern Western secular civilization as the latest great new event in the world. As we follow that rise, from the first premonition of it in the genius of Frederick II Hohenstaufen, through the Renaissance to the eruption of democracy and science and modem scientific technique, we think of all this as being the great new event in the world which demands our attention and calm. Man's our admiration. If we can bring ourselves to think of it, instead, as one of the vain repetitions of the Gentiles, an almost meaningless repetition of something that the Greeks and Romans did before us and did supremely well then the greatest new event in the history of mankind will be seen to be a very different one. The greatest new event will then not be the monotonous rise of yet another secular civilization out of the bosom of the Christian Church in the course of these latter centuries, it will still be the crucifixion and its spiritual consequences. There is one curious result of our immense modern scientific discoveries which is, I think, often overlooked. On the vastly changed timescale, which our astronomers and geologists have opened up to us, the beginning of the Christian era is an extremely recent date, on a timescale in which 1900 years are no more than the twinkling of an eye, the beginning of the Christian era is only yesterday. It is only on the old-fashioned timescale, on which the creation of the world and the beginning of life on the planet were reckoned to have taken place not more than 6,000 years ago, that a span of 1900 years seems a long period of time and the beginning of the Christian era, therefore, seems a far-off event. In fact it is a very recent event, perhaps the most recent significant event in history, and that brings us to a consideration of the prospects of Christianity in the future history of mankind on earth. On this view of the history of religion and of the civilizations, it has not been the historical function of the Christian Church just to serve as a chrysalis between the Greco-Roman civilization and its daughter civilizations in Byzantium and the West, and, supposing that these two civilizations, which are descended from the ancient Greco, Roman 1, turn out to be no more than vain repetitions of their parent, 
then there will be no reason to suppose that Christianity itself will be superseded by some distinct, separate, and different higher religion which will serve as a chrysalis between the death of the present Western civilization and the birth of its children. On the theory that religion is subservient to civilization, you would expect some new higher religion to come into existence on each occasion, in order to serve the purpose of tiding over the gap between one civilization and another. If the truth is the other way round, if it is civilization that is the means and religion that is the end, then, once again, a civilization may break down and break up, but the replacement of one higher religion by another will not be a necessary consequence. So far from that, if our secular Western civilization perishes, Christianity may be expected not only to endure but to grow in wisdom and stature as the result of a fresh experience of secular catastrophe. There is one unprecedented feature of our own post-Christian secular civilization which, in spite of being a rather superficial feature, has a certain importance in this connection. In the course of its expansion our modern Western secular civilization has become literally worldwide and has drawn into its net all other surviving civilizations as well as primitive societies. At its first appearance, Christianity was provided by the Greco-Roman civilization with a universal state, in the shape of the Roman Empire with its policed roads and shipping routes, as an aid to the spread of Christianity round the shores of the Mediterranean. Our modern Western secular civilization in its turn may serve its historical purpose by providing Christianity with a completely worldwide repetition of the Roman Empire to spread over. We have not quite arrived at our Roman Empire yet, though the victor in this war may be the founder of it. But, long before a world is unified politically, it is unified economically and in other material ways, and the unification of our present world has long since opened the way for us to Paul, who once traveled from the Orontes to the Tiber under the aegis of the Pax Romarn, to travel on from the Tiber to the Mississippi and from the Mississippi to the Yangtze, while Clements and Origen's work of infusing Greek philosophy into Christianity at Alexandria might be emulated in some city of the Far East by the infusion of Chinese philosophy into Christianity. This intellectual feat has indeed been partly performed already. One of the greatest of modern missionaries and modern scholars, Matteo Ricci, who was both a Jesuit father and a Chinese literatus, set his hand to that task before the end of the 16th century of the Christian era. It is even possible that as, under the Roman Empire, Christianity drew out of and inherited from the other Oriental religions the heart of what was best in them, so the present religions of India and the form of Buddhism that is practiced today in the Far East may contribute new elements to be grafted onto Christianity in days to come. And then one may look forward to what may happen when Caesar's empire decays, for Caesar's empire always does decay after a run of a few hundred years. What may happen is that Christianity may be left as the spiritual heir of all the other higher religions, from the post-Sumerian rudiment of one in the worship of Tammuz and Ishtar down to those that in AD. 1948 are still living separate lives side by side with Christianity, and of all the philosophies from Ignatans to Hegel's, while the Christian church as an institution may be left as the social heir of all the other churches and all the civilizations. That side of the picture brings one to another question, which is both always old and always new, the question of the relation of the Christian church to the kingdom of heaven. We seem to see a series of different kinds of society succeeding one another in this world. As the primitive species of societies has given place to a second species known as the civilizations within the brief period of the last 6,000 years, so this second species of local and ephemeral societies may perhaps give place in its turn to a third species embodied in a single worldwide and enduring representative in the shape of the Christian Church. If we can look forward to that, we shall have to ask ourselves this question, supposing that this were to happen. Would it mean that the kingdom of heaven would then have been established on earth? I think this question is a very pertinent one in our day, because some kind of earthly paradise is the goal of most of the current secular ideologies. To my mind the answer is emphatically, no, for several reasons which I shall now do my best to put before you. One very obvious and well-known reason lies in the nature of society and in the nature of man. Society is, after all, only the common ground between the fields of action of a number of personalities, and human personality, at any rate as we know it in this world, has an innate capacity for evil as well as for good. If these two statements are true, as I believe them to be, 
than in any society on earth. Unless and until human nature itself undergoes a moral mutation which would make an essential change in its character, the possibility of evil, as well as of good, will be born into the world afresh with every child and will never be wholly ruled out as long as that child remains. Alive. This is as much as to say that the replacement of a multiplicity of civilizations by a universal church would not have purged human nature of original sin, and this leads to another consideration, so long as original sin remains an element in human nature, Caesar will always have work to do, and there will still be Caesar as things to be rendered to Caesar, as well as God as to God, in this world. Human society on earth will not be able wholly to dispense with institutions of which the sanction is not purely the individual's active will to make them work, but is partly habit and partly even force. These imperfect institutions will have to be administered by a secular power which might be subordinated to religious authority but would not thereby be eliminated. And even if Caesar were not merely subordinated but were wholly eliminated by the church, something of him would still survive in the constitution of his supplanter, for the institutional element has historically, up to date, been dominant in the life of the church herself in her traditional Catholic form, which, on the long historical view, is the form in which one has to look at her, slash, in this Catholic form of the Church, I see two fundamental institutions, the sacrifice of the Mass and the hierarchy, which are indissolubly welded together by the fact that the priest, by definition, is the person with the power to perform the rite. If, in speaking of the Mass, one may speak, without offense, with the tongues of the historian and the anthropologist, then, using this language, one may describe the sacrifice of the Mass as the mature form of a most ancient religious rite of which the rudiments can be traced back to the worship of the fertility of the earth and her fruits by the earliest tillers of the soil. I am speaking here merely of the mundane origin of the rite. Caridade.s for the hierarchy of the Church in its traditional form, this, as one knows, is modeled on a more recent and less awe-inspiring yet nevertheless most potent institution, the M. Imperial Civil Service of the Roman Empire The Church in its traditional form thus stands forth armed with the spear of the Mass, the shield of the hierarchy, and the helmet of the papacy, and perhaps the subconscious purpose, or the divine intention, if you prefer that language, of this heavy panoply of institutions in which the Church has. Clad herself is the very practical one of outlasting the toughest of the secular institutions of this world, including all the civilizations. If we survey all the institutions of which we have knowledge in the present and in the past, I think that the institutions created, or adopted and adapted by Christianity are the toughest and the most enduring of any that we know, and are therefore the most likely to last and outlast all the rest. The history of Protestantism would seem to indicate that the Protestant act of casting off this armor 400 years ago was premature, but that would not necessarily mean that this step would always be a mistake and, however that may be, the institutional element in the traditional Catholic form of the church militant on earth, even if it proves to be an invaluable and indispensable means of survival, is all the same a mundane feature which makes the church militant's life different from that of the kingdom of heaven, in which they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God, and in which each individual soul catches the spirit of God from direct communion with him, like light caught from a leaping flame, as Plato puts it in his seventh letter. Thus, even if the church had won a fully worldwide allegiance and had entered into the inheritance of the last of the civilizations and of all the other higher religions, the church on earth would not be a perfect embodiment here on earth of the kingdom of heaven, the church on earth would still have sin and sorrow to contend with as well as to profit by as a means of grace on the principle of Taflas I, ID 9 OG, and she would still have to wear for a long time to come a panoply of institutions to give her the massive social solidity that she needs in the mundane struggle for survival, but this at the inevitable price of spiritually weighing her down, fan this showing, the victorious church. Militant on earth will be a province of the kingdom of God, but a province in which the citizens of the heavenly commonwealth have to live and breathe and labor in an atmosphere that is not their native element carrot. The position in which the Church would then find herself is well conveyed in Plato's conceit, in the Phaedo, of the true surface of the earth. We live, Plato suggests, in a large but local hollow, and what we take to be the air is really a sediment of fog. If one day we could make our way to the upper levels of the surface of the earth, we should there breathe the pure ether and should see the 
light of the sun and stars direct, and then we should realize how dim and blurred had been our vision down in the hollow, where we see the heavenly bodies, through the murky atmosphere in which we breathe, as imperfectly as the fishes see them through the water in which they swim. This platonic conceit is a good simile for the life of the church militant on earth, but the truth cannot be put better than it has been by St. Augustine. It is written of Cain that he founded a commonwealth, but Abel, true to the type of the pilgrim and sojourner that he was, did not do the like. For the commonwealth of the saints is not of this world, though it does give birth to citizens here in whose persons it performs its pilgrimage until the time of its kingdom shall come, the time when it will gather them all together. To this brings me in conclusion to the last of the topics on which I am going to touch, that of the relation between Christianity and progress. If it is true, as I think it is, that the church on earth will never be a perfect embodiment of the kingdom of heaven, in what sense can we say the words of the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, that will be done in earth as it is in Elevan? Have we been right, after all, in calm? ING to the conclusion that, in contrast to the cyclic move to St. Augustine, De Civitate Day, Book 15, Chapter 1 Merit of the rises and falls of civilizations The history of religion on earth is a movement in a single continuous upward line? What are the matters in which there has been, in historical times, a continuous religious advance three, and have we any reason to think that this advance will con? Continue without end? Even if the species of societies called civilizations does give way to a historically younger and perhaps spiritually higher species embodied in a single worldwide and enduring representative in the shape of the Christian Church, may there not come a time when the tug of war between Christianity and original sin will settle down to a static balance of spiritual forces? Let me put forward one or two considerations in reply to these questions. In the first place, religious progress means spiritual progress, and spirit means personality. Therefore religious progress must take place in the spiritual fives of personalities, it must show itself in their rising to a spiritually higher state and achieving a spiritually finer activity. Now, in assuming that this individual progress is what spiritual progress means, are we after all admitting Fraser's thesis that the higher religions are essentially and incurably antisocial? Does a shift of human interest and energy from trying to create the values aimed at in the civilizations to trying to create the values aimed at in the higher religions mean that the values for which the civilizations stand are bound to suffer, are spiritual and social values antithetical and inimical to each other? Is it true that the fabric of civilization is undermined if the salvation of the individual soul is taken as being the supreme aim of life? Jay Fraser answers these questions in the affirmative. If his answer were right it would mean that human fife was a tragedy without a catharsis. But I personally believe that. Fraser's answer is not right, because I think it is based on a fundamental misconception of what the nature of souls or personalities is, personalities are inconceivable except as agents of spiritual activity, and the only conceivable scope for spiritual activity lies in relations between spirit and spirit. It is because spirit implies spiritual relations that Christian theology has completed the Jewish doctrine of the unity of God with the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is the theological way of expressing the revelation that God is a spirit, the doctrine of the redemption is the theological way of X. Pressing the revelation that God is love. If man has been created in the likeness of God, and if the true end of man is to make this likeness ever more and more like, then Aristotle saying that man is a social animal applies to man's highest potentiality and aim, that of trying to get into ever closer communion with God. Seeking God is itself a social act. And if God's love has gone into action in this world in the redemption of mankind by Christ, then man's efforts to make himself liker to God must include efforts to follow Christ's example in sacrificing him. Self for the redemption of his fellow men. Seeking and following God in this way, that is God's way, is the only true way for a human soul on earth to seek salvation. The antithesis between trying to save one's own soul by seeking and following God and trying to do one's duty to one's neighbor is therefore wholly false. The two activities are indissoluble. I the human soul that is truly seeking to save itself is as fully social a being as the ant-like Spartan or the bee-like communist, carrot only, 
the Christian soul on earth is a member of a very different society from Sparta or Leviathan. He is a citizen of the kingdom of God, and therefore his paramount and all-embracing aim is to attain the highest degree of communion with, and likeness to, God, himself, his relations with his fellow men are consequences of, and corollaries to, his relations with God, and his way of loving his neighbor as himself will be to try to help his neighbor to win what he is seeking. For himself, that is, to come into closer communion with God and to become more godlike. If this is a soul's recognized aim for itself and for its fellow souls in the Christian church militant on earth, then it is obvious that under a Christian dispensation God's will will be done in earth as it is in heaven to an M. Measurably greater degree than in a secular mundane society HT is also evident that, in the church militant on earth, the good social aims of the mundane societies will incidentally be achieved very much more successfully than they ever have been or can be achieved in a mundane society, which aims at these objects direct, and at nothing. Higher, in other words, the spiritual progress of individual souls in this life will in fact bring with it much more social progress than could be attained in any other way. It is a paradoxical, but profoundly true and important principle of life that the most likely way to reach a goal is to be aiming not at that goal itself, but at some more ambitious goal beyond it. This is the meaning of the fable M. The Old Testament of Solomon's choice and of the saying in the New Testament about losing one's life and saving carrot therefore, while the replacement of the mundane civilizations by the worldwide and enduring reign of the church militant on earth would certainly produce what? To DAV would seem a miraculous improvement M. Those moorhane social conditions which the civilizations have been seeking to improve during the last SX the aim and test of progress under a truly Christian. Pensation on earth would not lie in the field of mundane social life, the field would be the spiritual life of individual souls in their passages through this earthly life from birth into this world to death out of it. But if spiritual progress in time in this world means progress achieved by individual human souls during their passages through this world to the other world, in what sense can there be any spiritual progress over a time span far longer than that of individual lives on earth, and running into thousands of years, such as that of the historical? Development of the higher religions from the rise of Thomas' worship and the generation of Abraham to the Christian era? I have already confessed my own adherence to the traditional Christian view that there is no reason to expect any change in unredeemed human nature while human life on earth goes on. Till this earth ceases to be physically habitable by man, we may expect that the endowments of individual human beings with original sin and with natural goodness will be about the same, on the average, as they always have been as far as our knowledge goes. J the most. Primitive societies known to us in the life or by report provide examples of as great natural goodness as, and no lesser wickedness than, the highest civilizations or religious societies that have yet come into existence. Ajay here has been no perceptible variation in the average sample of human nature in the past, there is no ground in the evidence. Afforded by history, to expect any great variation in the future either for better or for worse. The matter in which there might be spiritual progress in time on a time span extending over many successive generations of life on earth is not the unregenerate nature of man, but the opportunity open to souls, by way of the learning that comes through suffering, for getting into closer communion with God, and becoming less unlike Him, during their passage through this world. What Christ, with the prophets before Him and the saints after Him, has bequeathed to the Church, and what the Church, by virtue of having been fashioned into an Incomparably effective institution, succeeds in accumulating, preserving, and communicating to successive generations of Christians, is a growing fund of illumination and of grace, meaning by illumination the discovery or revelation or revealed discovery of the true nature of God and the true end of man here and hereafter, and by grace, the will or inspiration or inspired will to aim at getting into closer communion with God and becoming less unlike Him. In this matter of increasing spiritual opportunity for souls in their passages through life on earth, there is assuredly an inexhaustible possibility of progress in this world. Is the spiritual opportunity given by Christianity or by one or other of the higher religions that have been forerunners of Christianity and have partially anticipated Christianity's gifts of illumination and grace to men on earth, an indispensable condition for salvation meaning by salvation the spiritual effect on a soul of feeling after God and Finding him in its passage through life on earth? 
If this were so, then the innumerable generations of men who never had the chance of receiving the illumination and grace conveyed by Christianity and the other higher religions would have been born and have died without a chance of the salvation which is the true end of man and the true purpose of life on earth. Q is might be conceivable, though still repugnant, if we believed that the true purpose of life on earth was not the preparation of souls for another life but the establishment of the best possible human society in this world, which in the Christian belief is not the true purpose, though it is an almost certain byproduct of a pursuit of the true purpose? If progress is taken as being the social progress of Leviathan and not the spiritual progress of individual souls, then it would perhaps be conceivable that, for the gain and glory of the body social, innumerable earlier generations should have been doomed to live a lower social life in order that a higher social life might eventually be lived by successors who had entered into their labors. This would be conceivable on the hypothesis that individual human souls existed for the sake of society, and not for their own sakes or for God's. But this belief is not only repugnant, but is also inconceivable when we are dealing with the history of religion, where the progress of individual souls through this world towards God, and not the progress of society in this world, is the end on which the supreme value is set. We cannot believe that the historically incontestable fact that illumination and grace have been imparted to men on earth in successive installments, beginning quite recently in the history of the human race on earth, and even then coming gradually in the course of generations, can have entailed the consequence that the vast majority of souls born into the world up to date, who have had no share in the spiritual opportunity, have, as a result, been spiritually lost. We must believe that the possibilities, provided by God, of learning through suffering in this world have always afforded a sufficient means of salvation to every soul that has made the best of the spiritual opportunity offered. To adhere, however, small that opportunity may have been. But, if men on earth have not had to wait for the advent of the higher religions, culminating in Christianity, in order to qualify, in their life on earth, for eventually attaining, after death, the state of eternal felicity in the other world, then what difference has the advent on earth of the higher religions, and of Christianity itself, really made? The difference, I should say, is this, that, under the Christian dispensation, a soul which does make the best of its spiritual opportunities will, in qualifying for salvation, be advancing farther towards communion with God and towards likeness to God under the conditions of life on earth, before death, than has been possible for souls that have not been illuminated during their pilgrimage on earth. By the light of the higher religions. A pagan soul, no less than a Christian soul, has ultimate salvation with its reach, but a soul which has been offered, and has opened itself to, the illumination and the grace that Christianity conveys, will, while still in this world, be more brightly irradiated. With the light of the other world than a pagan soul that has won salvation by making the best, in this world, of the narrower opportunity here open to it. The Christian soul can attain, while still on earth, a greater measure of manus greatest good than can be attained by any pagan soul in this earthly stage of its existence. Slash carrot has the historical progress of religion in this world, as represented by the rise of the higher religions and by their culmination in Christianity, may, and almost certainly will, bring with it, incidentally, an immeasurable improvement in the conditions of human social life on earth, but its direct effect and its deliberate aim and its true test is the opportunity which it brings to individual souls for spiritual progress in this world during the passage from birth to death, forward slash it is this individual spiritual progress in this world for which we pray when we say that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It is for the salvo on that. Is open to all men of goodwill, pagan as well as Christian, primitive as well as civilized, who make the most of their spiritual opportunities on earth, however narrow these opportunities may be, that we pray when we say thy kingdom come. 13. The meaning of history for the sole theologia historicide The questions discussed in this essay have been debated acutely, for centuries past, by theologians and philosophers. In talking them up, the present writer is therefore likely to fall into errors that will seem elementary to his readers. He will certainly be treading on ground that is familiar and well-worn to them. He ventures, nevertheless, on this inquirant the hope that it may be of some interest to theologians to see how these old theological questions are approached by a historian. In any case, theologians may perhaps find some amusement in watching an unwary historian floundering in well-known and minutely charted theological morasses. 
Let us start our inquiry by examining successively two points of view which lie at opposite extremes of the historico-theological gamut, but which, if respectively tenable, would each solve the problem of the meaning of history. For the soul, in fairly simple terms. In the writer's opinion, he may as well declare in advance, both points of view are in truth untenable, though each does contain an ELE. MCNT of truth, which it invalidates through the exaggeration of pushing it to extremes. A purely this worldly view the first of these two extreme views is that, for the soul, the whole meaning of its existence is contained in history. On this view, the individual human being is nothing but a part of the society of which he is a member. The individual exists for society, not society for the individual. Therefore, the significant and important thing in human life is not the spiritual development of souls, but the social development of communities, J. and the writer's opinion, this thesis is not true, and, when it has been taken as true and has been put into action, it has produced moral enormities, carrot. The proposition that the individual is a mere part of a social whole may be the truth about social insects, bees, ants, and termites, but it is not the truth about any human beings of whom we have any knowledge, an early 20th century school of anthropologists, of which Durkheim was the leading representative, drew a picture of. Primitive man which portrayed him as being almost of a different mental and spiritual breed from our allegedly rational selves. Drawing its evidence from descriptions of surviving primitive societies, this school represented primitive man as being governed not by the rational operation of the individual intellect, but by the collective emotion of the human herd. This sharp distinction between an uncivilized and a civilized breed of man has, however, to be radically revised and toned down in the light of the illuminating psychological discoveries that have been made since Durkheim's day. Psychological research has shown us that the so-called savage has no monopoly of the emotionally governed life of the collective unconscious. Though it happens to have been first laid bare in the soul of primitive man by anthropological observation, psychological research has made it clear that, in our comparatively sophisticated souls too, the collective unconscious underlies a consciousness that rides on it like a cockle shell floating precariously on a bottomless and shoreless ocean. Whatever the constitution of the human psyche may prove to be, we can already be more or less certain that it is substantially the same in human beings like ourselves, who are in the act of attempting to climb from the level of primitive human life to the ledge of civilization, and in ex-primitives, like the Papuans of New Guinea and the Negritos of Central Africa who have been played upon, within the last few thousand years, by the radiation of societies that have been in process of civilization within that period. The psychic makeup of all extant human beings, in all extant types of society, appears to be substantially identical, and we have no ground for believing it to have been different in the earliest representatives of the species sapiens of the genus Homo that are known to us, not from the anthropologist's personal inter. Course with living people, but from the archaeologist S and the physiologist's deciphering of the revealing evidence of artifacts and skeletons. Gene the most primitive as well as in the least primitive state in which Homo sapiens is in any way known to us, we may conclude that the individual human being possesses some measure of self-conscious per. Sonality that raises his soul above the level of the waters of the collective unconscious, and this means that die. Individual soul does have a genuine life of its own which is distinct from the life of society, backslash we may also conclude that individuality is a pearl of great moral price, when we obey. Serve the moral enormities that occur when this pearl is trampled in the mire. These enormities are most conspicuous in extreme examples, the Spartan way of life in the society of classical Greece, the Ottoman Sultan slave household in the early modern Islamic world, the totalitarian regimes that have been established by force in a number of Western or par. Tiley westernized countries in our own day. But when once we have grasped, from such extreme cases, what the nature of these moral enormities is, it is more instructive to detect the Spartan tincture in the patriotism of the ordinary classical Greek city-state and the totalitarian tincture in our ordinary modern Western nationalism. In religious terms, this treatment of the individual as a mere part of the community is a denial of the personal relation between the soul and God and is a substitution for the worship of God, of a worship of the human community, Leviathan, the abomination of desolation, standing in the 
place where it ought not backslash the German National Socialist Youth Leader, Baldur von Skyrak, once declared that his task was to build a great altar to Germany in every German hearty it must be wrong to worship a man-made institution which is ephemeral, imperfect, and often utterly evil in its operation, and it is worth recalling that a particu. Larley Noble, perhaps the noblest conceivable, form of this Leviathanership was intransigently rejected by early Christianity. If any human community were ever worthy of worship, it would be a universal state, like the Roman Empire, that has brought the blessings of unity and peace to a world long racked by war and revolution. Yet the early Christians challenged the apparently irresistible might of the Roman imperial government rather than compromise with a Leviathan worship that was persuasively calm. Mended to them as being nothing more sinister than an amiable formality. Leviathan worship is a moral enormity, even at its noblest and mildest, yet there is an element of truth underlying this mistaken belief that society is the end of man and that the individual is merely a means to that end. Carrot his underlying truth is that man is a social creature. Lie cannot achieve the potentialities of his nature except by going outside himself and entering into relations with other spiritual beings, slash the Christian would say that the most important of the soul's relations is its communion with God but that it also needs to have relations with its fellow creatures who are God's other children. A solely otherworldly view let us now take a flying leap to the opposite pole and examine the antithetical view that, for the soul, the whole meaning of its existence lies outside history. On this view, this world is wholly meaningless and evil. The task of the soul in this world is to endure it, to detach itself from it, to get out of it t this is the view of the Buddhist, Stoic and Epicurean schools of philosophy, whatever the Buddha's own personal outlook may have been. There is a strong vein of it in Platonism. And it has been one of the historic interpretations, in the writer's belief, a mistaken one, of Christianity according to the extreme Buddhist view, the soul itself is part and parcel of the phenomenal world, so that, in order to get rid of the phenomenal world, the soul has to x. Tingish itself. At any rate, it has to extinguish elements in itself which, to the Christian mind, are essential for the soul's existence, for example, above all, the feelings of love and pity. This is unmistakably evident in the Hinayana in interpretation of Buddhism, but it is also implicit in the Mahayana, however reluctant the followers of the Mahayana school may be to dwell on the ultimate implications of their own tenets. The Mahayanian Bodhisattva may be moved, by his love and pity for his fellow sentient beings, to postpone his own entry into nirvana for eons upon eons for the sake of helping his fellows to follow the path that he has found for himself. Slash it this path is, after all, the orthodox one that leads TB salvation through self-extinction, and the bodhisattva's sacrifice, though immense, is not irrevocable or everlasting. At long last, he is going to take that final step into the nirvana on whose threshold he already stands, and, in the act, he will extinguish, with himself, the love and pity that have won for him the answering love and gratitude of mankind, the Stoic might be described, perhaps too unkindly. As a would-be Buddhist who has not had quite the full courage of his convictions. As for the Epicurean, he regards this world as an accidental, meaningless, and evil product of the mechanical interplay of atoms and, since the probable duration of the particular ephemeral world in which he happens to find himself may be drearily long by. Comparison with a human being's expectation of life, he must look forward to, or expedite, his own dissolution as the only way out for himself. The Christian of the extreme otherworldly school does, of course, believe that God exists and that this world has been created by him for a purpose, but this purpose, as he sees it, is the negative one of training the soul by suffering, for a life in another world with which this world has nothing positive in common. This view that the whole meaning of the soul's existence lies outside history seems to the writer to present Diffie. Cultize, even in its attenuated Christian version, that are insurmountable from the Christian standpoint. In the first place, any such view is surely incompatible with the distinctive belief of Christianity about the nature of God, the belief that God loves his creatures and so loved the world that he became incarnate in order to bring redemption to human souls during their life on earth. It is hard to conceive of a loving God as creating this, or any, world of sentient creatures not for its own sake, but merely as a means to some end in another world for whose blissful denizens this world is a wasteland beyond the 
pale. It is even harder to conceive of him as deliberately charging this forlorn wasteland of his alleged creation with sin and suffering, in the cold-blooded spirit of a military commander who creates an exercise ground for his troops by taking, or making, a wilderness and sowing it with live mines, strewing it with unexploded shells and hand grenades, and drenching it with poison gas in order to train his soldiers to cope with these infernal machines at grievous cost to them in life and limb. Moreover, whatever may or may not be possible for God, we can declare with assurance that it is not possible for the soul to treat its relations in this world with other souls as being of no importance in themselves, but as being merely a means to its own salvation or of care it so, far from being a good training in this world for Christian perfection in another world, such odious inhumanity in man's attitude towards his fellow man would be an education in hardening his heart against the promptings of Christian love. In other words, it would be the worst conceivable miseducation from the Christian point of view. Finally, if we believe that all souls are objects of absolute value to God, we cannot but believe that they must also be of absolute value to one another whenever and wherever they meet, of absolute value in this world in anticipation of the next. The view that, for the soul, the whole meaning of its existence lies outside history thus proves to be no less repellent than the antithetical view which we examined first. Yet, in this case, as in that, there is an element of truth underlying the mistaken belief cubile it is not true that man's social life and human relations in this world are merely a means towards a personal spiritual end, the underlying truths are that in this world we do learn by suffering, that life in this world is not an end in itself and by itself, that it is only a fragment, even if an authentic one, of some larger whole, and that, in this larger whole, the central and dominant, though not the only, feature in the soul's spiritual landscape is its relation to God G. A third view, the world a province of the kingdom of God we have now rejected two views, both of which offer an answer to our question, what is the meaning of history for the soul? We have refused to admit that, for the soul, the meaning of its existence lies either wholly in history or wholly outside history. And this pair of negative conclusions confronts us with a dilemma. In rejecting the view that the meaning of the soul's existence lies wholly in history, we have vindicated the primacy, as a fact, as a right, and as a duty, of each individual soul's relation to God. But if every soul, at any time or place, and in any social or historical situation in this world, is in a position to know and love God, or, in traditional theological terms, in a position to find salvation, this truth might seem to empty history of significance. Else the most primitive people, in the most rudimentary conditions of social and spiritual life in this world, can achieve the true end of man in man's relation to God, then why should we strive to make this world a better place, j, indeed, what intelligible meaning could be attached to those words? On the other hand, in rejecting the view that the meaning of the soul's existence lies wholly outside history, we have vindicated the primacy of God's love in his relation to his creatures. But, if this world has the positive value that it must have if God loves it and has become incarnate in it, then his attempts, and our attempts, under his inspiration and on his behalf, to make this world a better place must be right and significant in some sense. Can we resolve this apparent contradiction? We might perhaps resolve it for practical purposes if we could find an answer to the question, in what sense can there be? Progress in this world? The progress with which we are here concerned is a progressive improvement, continuous and cumulative from generation to generation, in our social heritage. By progress, we must mean this, for there is no warrant for supposing that, within historical times, there has been any progress in the evolution of human nature itself either physical or spiritual. Even if we push our historical horizon back to the date of the first emergence of Homo sapiens, the period is infinitesimally short on the timescale of the evolution of life on this planet. Western man, at the present high level of his intellectual powers and technological aptitudes, has not sloughed off Adam's heirloom of original sin, and, to the best of our knowledge, Homo or Ignatius, a hundred thousand years ago, must have been endowed, for good or evil, with the selfsame spiritual, as well as physical, characteristics that we find in ourselves. Progress then, if discernible within historical times, must have been progress in the improvement of our social heritage and not progress in the improvement of our breed, 
and the evidence for social progress is, of course, impressive in the field of scientific knowledge and its application to technology, in everything, that is to say, which has to do with man's command over non-human nature. This, however, is a side issue, for the impressiveness of the evidence for progress in this particular field is matched by the obviousness of the fact that man is relatively good at dealing with non-human nature, doc what he is bad at is his dealing with human nature in himself and in his fellow human beings. A fortiori, he is proved to be very bad indeed at getting into the right relation with God. Tan has been a dazzling success in the field of intellect and know-how and a dismal failure in the things of the spirit, and it has been the great tragedy of human life on earth that this sensational inequality of man's respective achievements in the non-human and in the spiritual sphere should, so far at any rate, have been this way round, for the spiritual side of man's life is of vastly greater importance for man's well-being, even for his material well-being, in the last resort, than is his command over non-human nature. What is the position, then, in terms of this spiritual side of life which matters so much to man and in which he has so far been so backward? Can there be cumulative progress in the improvement of our social heritage in terms of the spiritual life of mankind, which means the spiritual life of individual souls, since man's relation to God is personal and not collective? A conceivable kind of progress in these spiritual terms, a kind that would give significance to history and would, so to speak, justify God's love for this world and his incarnation in it, would be a cumulative increase in the means of grace at the disposal of each soul in this world. There are, of course, elements, and very important elements, in man's spiritual situation in this world, which would not be affected by such an increase in the means of grace available. It would not affect either man's innate tendency to original sin or his capacity for obtaining salvation in this world. Every child would be born in the bondage of original sin under the new and the old spiritual dispensation alike, though the child BOM under the new dispensation might be far better armed and aided than his. Predecessors were for obtaining his liberation. Again, under the old and the new dispensation alike, the opportunity for obtaining salvation in this world would be open to every soul, since every soul always and everywhere has within its reach the possibility of knowing and loving God. The actual, and momentous, effect of a cumulative increase in the means of grace at man's disposal in this world would be to make it possible for human souls, while still in this world, to come to know God better and come to love Him more nearly in His own way. J. On such a view, this world would not be a spiritual X1 or size ground beyond the pale of the kingdom of God, it would be a province of the kingdom, one province only, and not the most important one, yet one which had the same absolute value as the rest, and therefore one in which. Spiritual action could, and would, be fully significant and worthwhile, the one thing of manifest and abiding value in a world in which all other things are vanity.